today we are hosting the vice president of Warburg Pincus India, Ria Grover, who will educate us on how the post MBA hiring for global private equity firms work. I hope you enjoy this episode. Happy watch. Hey Ria, welcome to my podcast. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Asim. Uh, uh, Ria, thank you so much uh, for doing the podcast with us. I know you're really busy and we've been going back and forth for a while in terms of when can we do this podcast, but we got this day. Uh, just wanted to like ask you right now, uh, you, you're putting up in Bombay, right? You're working in yes. Vogue's Mumbai office and you're putting up in Bombay. Nice. Yes, nice. that's nice. correct. For the audience context, we both have worked in similar, uh, the same consulting for Meliki Consulting. Uh, so that's one thing we share. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted yeah. to, uh, for this particular podcast, Ria, you know, uh, decode some important uh, themes which are not readily available for uh, consumption of audience, you know, who want to basically uh, crack global private equity roles after they have done MBA. You know, there's a lot of content available in general, but there is an if information asymmetry. So I wanted to first understand about your journey at Wharton. How, like, how was your experience at Wharton in general? Can you just give me a brief about that? What, what did you end up doing at Wharton? Yeah, what sure. What clubs you were part of, etc. If you can just give me some perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Wharton, firstly, is just a wonderful place to be. So yeah. all in all, my experience was very positive. Um, and I think I can break it down into two main buckets. One was more on the social and personal development front, and one was on the career development front. Um, maybe I'll start with the social front first because it's always more fun. Uh, yeah. But at Wharton, basically, we have this concept called stretch experiences, which is you voluntarily participate in things that stretch you in some way. So one mm -hmm. of those things for me was boxing. I fought in uh, Wharton's box boxing competition. So that's something that I never thought I could do or saw myself doing. So on the social front, there were a lot of those experiences, uh, which I don't think I could have had had I not gotten those two years of time to explore new things um, in a different country with a group of people who are in a similar headspace of exploration. Um, and that environment is something which is very, very good for your uh, personal growth, I would say. Mm. On the more professional front, um, again, I think there are a couple of um, ways in which I can divide this. The first was that I was a career switcher. So my first step was just to upskill myself. So that happens through classes or through clubs like the PEVC club. Um, you join these, they have lunch and learn series. They also give you resources, Wall Street prep and such um, that just help you upskill yourself and understand the buzzwords or the lingo surrounding a certain industry. Um, so that was more on upskilling myself. The second part of it was around networking. Um, and in a post MBA role, um, if you're going to a company, you also want to make sure that that's the company you want to be at for the long term. And the company also wants to make sure that the people they're hiring are there for the long term. So the fit is important. And um, the more you can network and organically meet people, get to know uh, what the company is really about, the better it is. And um, if you can do that before the actual process starts, like meet somebody from the company, just understand what they do, what their thesis is. Um, that's very helpful, I found, um, in narrowing down your target list and even in recruiting thereafter. Yeah. So one of the things that I did was uh, Wharton India Economic Forum. Since I was in a US university recruiting for India, um, I felt it would be a good opportunity for me to meet professionals in India who are working within the industry that I was targeting, which was broadly buy side investing um, roles, right? So um, I, it's basically a conference pretty similar to any conference that we have in Indian colleges and universities. Um, so that's one of the things that I did on the networking front. On the networking front, I would also say one more thing. I think I leveraged my classmates a lot. I think it's a very, very underappreciated resource. Uh, there are so many people at business school who are from roles that other people at business schools want to go at. And speaking to them about their experiences, I thought was super helpful, just using them as a sounding board to say that, hey, I'm working on this thesis. Uh, do you even think this is an area that's that investors are interested in right now. Mm -hmm. um, getting context on really basic things, I think leveraging your classmates 
um, at least for me, was was a really, really big part of um, making my Wharton experience. And then I focused on some experiential opportunities, which is to practice all this that I was learning. So right. I led something called Venture Foragers at Wharton, where uh, we have teams focusing on certain sectors that build an investment thesis, and that culminates into a presentation uh, for VCs in SF. So we fly down to SF for two days, and uh, we present these theses to nice. different VCs and get their nice. feedback. So um, that's that's how I would divide my sort of professional experience. Two, two questions here. Number one, uh, yeah. did you uh, did you box before going to Wharton? No, I actually uh, picked up boxing a little bit uh, during the pandemic. I think we all okay. have picked up at least one hobby during the pandemic. If, yeah, if the yeah, pandemic yeah. has given us anything, it's uh, basically some life outside of work and the focus towards that. Um, so I picked up boxing during the pandemic and decided to continue it. But by no means uh, was I even <laughs> close. I don't even have siblings. So the idea of hitting and getting... Um, it was something which was very alien to me and um, that's why I thought it was a stretch experience in that sense. So, you, before going to Wharton, you had uh, you had a lot of experience in strategy consulting, especially focused on diligence, as well as you were at Bharat Pay and you did some impact finance for a while. Just wanted to understand, were you very clear going into Wharton that you want to end up in private equity, late stage investing? Did you have that clarity or you developed that while you were at Wharton? Yeah, that's a really good question. I didn't have that clarity when I was applying. Mm. I knew I wanted to come back to India. I knew I wanted to work in something that creates economic value. Um, and those were my guiding forces uh, when I started applying. And just for some context, I actually applied uh, to start in 2019 to start business school in 2020. And I ended up deferring by a year because of COVID. Ah, okay. um, and in that year is when I gained clarity about what I really want to do. So um, I knew I wanted to be in a more action-oriented role. So strategy consulting tends to be more on more advisory related. And I knew that I wanted to be in the middle of the action. Um, mm. So I had two hypotheses going in. Do I want to be a startup operator or an operator in general? Or do I want to be an investor and make decisions at that level? Uh, but I really wanted to do something which has decision making involved in it. Uh, but since I hadn't had any of those experiences, I really wasn't sure which direction I wanted to go in. So I used the deferral year that I had to get some operator experience at Bharat Bay and figured out if that is the side of things that I enjoy more or do I enjoy more being on the investing side um, working on different things. What is this, where is my skill set uh, most valuable? And I think as an operator, uh, you need you need to be eighty percent action and twenty percent thinking. And mm. uh, maybe as an investor, it's it's more forty sixty. So uh, from that perspective, I just thought being an operator was very go go go. Um, whereas I like to take my time with time with things. I like to be patient and the more long-term investment horizon that kind of appealed a little bit more to me. So that's when I gained a little bit clarity in the period after I got in and before I started working. And I think that um, is probably something I'd like to share with the audience. Use your time that you have before you actually start business school right. really well to start figuring things out because once you're there, there are going to be so many priorities and so many things yeah. to figure out. It's it's yeah. easy to get confused and flown away by certain opportunities that other people are doing. But if you do that hard work during your application process, do the soul searching before you start business school, it's going to give you a lot more clarity uh, once you're there in the middle of the action. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, no, no, this, is, this is very good just to understand that when you were at Wharton from day when you knew what you wanted. It's a lot of time what happens is, uh, at least that's what I've seen with folks who uh, end up at Indian B schools, you know, they sort of figured a lot of things out while at B school. Uh, of course, they also don't have a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, which uh, say someone from Wharton would have in terms of say buy side roles. But yes, this is what you just mentioned, you know, just have that clarity when you're going into B school that would set you apart and sort of help you uh, navigate the jobs uh, ecosystem probably a lot better than especially for an international student, right? Who's probably also yeah. going to be spending a lot of money to get this MBA, right? Uh, one thing this wanted to understand now from you, uh, Ria, how did Wharton really, 
how does Wharton's career placement uh, process really work? Say, I want to get into buy side. I, I'm a I'm a career switcher. So, what are the resources, or say, how does a career placement cell really help you get your right role? Uh, do they have like these? Uh, do they invite companies on campus and sort of take interviews on campus? Or do you approach companies? How does it really work? Or I just want to understand the entire process. Because, you know, like I get a lot of people to say, you know, you have to actually approach companies. Some people say companies come to campus. I just don't know. And I'm assuming it's not the same as how Indian B-School placements work. Yeah, you're right there. I think the way placements sort of work in US B-Schools is a little bit more ad hoc. There is no one day when all companies come. There's no tiered right. structure in which uh, the order in which companies come. There's nothing like that. It's a little bit more ad hoc. Uh, but having said that, I do think one way career services helps is that they create a very nice timeline and path for you to follow, like a step-by-step -step guide of the first step is figuring out your CV. The second step is figuring out your cover letter. The third step is figuring out a list of target funds that you want to apply to. So they give you a list of things that you need to do, um, which is which makes it a lot easier than having to reinvent the process yourself. This process works. They've seen it work for years now. So yes. that is one thing that they help with. Apart from that, they will provide you resources attached to each step of that process. So for example, for your resume, which would be one of the first things you would develop, um, they would help you review the resume. They would give you past year resumes. Um, they have tools which can help you improve the way that you talk about your experiences. Um, and they will help you shortlist what to highlight for depending on the role that you're applying to, right? Um, and I think that's very valuable guidance. And usually, at least in um, US business schools, the career services uh, folks have been uh, industry professionals. So for example, we okay. had somebody who who used to be working in private equity before. So they have a lot of context about uh, when somebody who's in the industry is reading the resume, what is it that they're taking away from it? And that context is very helpful to have, especially for someone like me who's a career switcher and I just don't have enough context about the industry. So I think that's where career services helps. Um, though, if you're recruiting for India from a US business school, I think the second part of what you said, which is connecting you to companies, having a roster of companies that comes in every year, having those relationships, I think that still exists, but it is lower, as you can imagine, right? Because most of their relationships would be in the US. And so, uh, for example, Warburg is something that I got in touch with through Wharton Career Services, but through their global office, because the global office has a relationship with Wharton um, and or comes comes to campus to recruit and so that and they knew that I want to recruit for India. So that's how um, Warburg India happened. Understood. So the takeaway I have here is uh, for the audience, guys, work hard, get into Wharton. If you're not in Wharton, uh, Warburg ain't coming to your campus. No, I, I, I don't I don't think that's I don't think that is the takeaway at all. And I also want to talk something about you said earlier, uh, especially with respect to Indian business schools versus US business schools. Yeah. I think the biggest difference is work X. So a mm. lot of in India, we often glorify reaching the MBA. And so yeah. a lot yeah. of times I've seen the mindset is to get there as soon as possible. But I don't actually think that works. In my personal experience as well, that extra year that I had um, actually, at the time, I felt like, oh, I'm deferring my MBA by a year. Is this the right decision or not? But in hindsight, it was one of the best decisions I could have made because there is a lot of value to be added by extra years of work experience, um, mm -hmm. which the traditional model of applying right after undergrad or with one or two years of work experience, that model shakes that a little bit. So um, I, I think it... it work experience has a large role to play in 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 this as well. So that my takeaway would be that don't be in a hurry to get to business school. Your career is very long, right? So it doesn't matter. Your business school is just a milestone. It matters more what you do 10 years out. So understood. Settle this debate for me, uh, Ria. Like I was having I was having this chat with a headhunter who was telling me that uh, if you basically uh, graduate only from the Harvard, Stanford, and Whartons of the of the world, only then you'll actually end up getting a good shot, maybe an interview with the top global funds. If you want to come back to India, 
does it still hold true or do you think if i'm if i if i'm at a different if i'm not at one of the hsws i still have a shot hmm i think so but um then you would have to have private equity experience so uh, lateral uh, hiring happens uh, all the time um it. doesn't necessarily there is not just that one path to get into private equity and i think the more senior you get in your career there are multiple paths for you to approach a certain organization which is why i said that you need to be clear about where you want to get long term and everything else in the middle is just milestones and mm. um if if somebody wants to work at a global fund that is very much possible from an indian business school it might mean that you may have to work in another fund for a few years or uh find another path to it um and just some context on recruiting right most of these funds have 20 people 30 people uh they don't really yeah. have the bandwidth to run a very very long or large recruiting process um and it's simply just that so cons- your consulting firms if you're if you're a consulting firm you're hiring maybe 40 people post mba 50 people post mba and then it makes sense for you to have a more structured recruiting path expand the number of colleges that you go to but if you need maybe one or two people every year and sometimes not even that it doesn't make sense for you to have a proper um recruiting organization around it right um and so which is why i think it it gets a little bit selective but i would not think that there is no path to it um there is a path to it in my mind understood understood but for career switches you would sort of agree that going to a school like wharton definitely helps you make that switch it's much easier uh, compared yeah. to say uh, understood now i want to double i want to double click on uh, global funds in india and their hiring process when they go to wharton can you talk about your experience of recruiting uh, r- right i just want to understand the pipeline how does it really work out because someone say you know who wants to invest say x 200000 dollars in an mba and they want to get this clarity as well how do you get these roles yeah so uh, when you say pipeline do you mean the recruiting cycle or do you want me to walk you through step by step of when they come i think that would really help you know if you can just okay. uh, break break it down into like bits sure so um typically us business school start in august and uh, most of the recruiting starts in october november i would say um and oh, october really? november the same, is of the same year yeah, of the same year, of the ah. same year. and ah, october okay. november is when funds start coming in you start getting opportunities in your inbox through career services um and they'll start asking for your resumes but one thing with investing is that it can go on all the way till may of next year so it some funds will come early some will come late which is why one of the things that career services tells you to do is to create a target list of which funds you're most interested in um and then see when they've recruited historically um and then try to plan your recruiting around that so mm-hmm. for example indian funds tend to recruit so there are two buckets of indian funds there are funds that have a sort of structured recruiting process wherein they will at least come to campus and maybe sometimes hire one one or maybe two people sometimes um but it's it's not a given that they will hire every year but they have a structured process if they hire they come around december or january so you know that right uh, wow. versus there are some funds which do a little bit more ad hoc hiring and uh, it also depends on the stage of the fund so late stage funds tend to have a little bit more of a structured process versus early stage funds uh, would come just in time when they need somebody um, be- just because of the way it's structured and they tend to be sometimes even smaller so um, they'll come maybe sometimes in may or sometimes in april and for an internship for the summer so it could be which starts in maybe june or july right so it could be that close to your actual internship and so that's why i said that the us business school recruiting process is quite ad hoc there is it it sort of is better in india where you know that companies are going to come on x day and then you're ready for it and by the by x plus 2 days you know whether you're going to that company or not right it's a little bit more long drawn in the us i would say um so that's the first step they would start coming to campus they would uh, take your resumes and then you want me to walk you through what happens after that the interview process as well if you can just if you can just let me know you know how, yeah. how does the what what kind of 
depth do they expect from a yeah. potential candidate who will eventually get the offer what kind of depth in terms of the knowledge they are expecting from this person yeah sure so i think the short answer is a lot uh, a lot of depth <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the, again it really depends on the fund some funds would have a modeling round before they even or a uh, they will give you a company and they will ask you to uh, build a small deck on it about how you would go about valuing it what do you right. think about it whether you think it's a good uh, investment opportunity or not basically an investment memo and um, you you first do that round some funds don't have it some funds have it after that you'll uh, do an interview those interviews can range anywhere from technical which is them giving you a company and you you're being asked to value it to a little bit more on um just getting to know each other i think the more up you go uh, the more it's about getting to know each other but also mm -hmm. i would say less from an hr perspective and more from a what is your motivation how what is your world view how do you view uh, investing what is your investment thesis as are you risk averse are you risk taking um how would you think about companies fundamentally the companies that you've worked at what is your level of understanding of those company from an invest putting an investor's hat on so those would be the things that they would test and which is why i said that there would be a lot of depth uh the thing with post mba roles though is that um they expect you to have a point of view and add value from day one so from they're day. not um exactly so it's not that 100% of the focus would be on technicals obviously technicals is almost like a baseline you need to have a basic level of technicals in place but i think the focus a little bit more is on how would you really be as an investor can they tr trust you to make an investment judgment how thoughtful are you about everything that goes into the model rather than the model itself so i think those things matter a little bit more in post mba recruiting um or that was my experience at least hmm understood and this, this is pretty comprehensive in terms of you know the kind of expectations they have right from get go <laughs> yeah and very early on these funds come so you need to be really prepared you know for for these interviews and have this thesis ready with you so i wanted to you have a very interesting uh, journey area uh, you've interned in both late stage which is uh, with vobok and you also interned with uh, nexus which is more of early stage investing uh, and so how how was your experience across early stage and late stage and what made you decide between these two offers yeah i think honestly both are really good opportunities and it really comes down to who you are as a person and what makes you happier on a day to day basis hmm. early stage tends to be more sourcing driven it's you're making a lot of bets so um obviously you have a lot more action you will be making you'll be doing a lot more deals in a year it's more fast pace and it's more for people who are um dreamers in some sense right like you need to see that outsized uh, outcome yeah. in these companies yeah. it's for risk takers it's for people who are closer to let's say entrepreneurs um uh, themselves right obviously investors and entrepreneurs are very different it's a different skill set but at least in mindset you need to be out there with the entrepreneur to see their vision with them um and that's the skill set or that's the kind of person who um thrives in that environment i think vc is is set for them um versus more late stage is set for people who are a little bit more grounded in numbers i think tend to be a little bit more uh, risk averse or rather than risk averse just a little bit um less comfortable with taking calls that are not backed by something that they can see right whether it's in terms of numbers or something else or someone has done something before it it there has to be something on the basis of which um you make that decision and and personally for me i mean i come from a commerce background spent first uh, formative years of my career working on diligences so i'm very comfortable with numbers and taking calls based on numbers it it has to do with your experience uh, and i just felt for a person like me i think i would strive in the latter environment a little bit more than the formal former environment so it's it just comes down to that got it got it so uh, i wanted to understand one thing here uh, You, you had the opportunity to intern with both late stage early stage investing firms uh, how many roles are available to indians who are coming back from their mbas in india how many global uh, global roles are available in private equity funds for indians yeah 
Yeah, so it really depends from year to year. Um, so maybe there would be around 10 global private equity funds in India. Um, not all of them would hire every year. And a lot of them also have people coming back. Um, so pre-MBA associates who get their MBA and have a return offer right, to of come, return, come of back course. to the office. So it really depends on how many of them are actually coming back to India um, versus going somewhere else or doing something else. And um, it also depends on how many people they hired the year before, uh, where they are in the fund cycle. Um, so there are a lot of things that determine whether those funds hire or not. Um, if they end up hiring, they would hire maybe one or two people would be a good hiring year for a fund, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's on private equity global funds. And of course, there are uh, domestic private equity funds as well where people come back to. Um, so there's uh, Kidara multiples and uh, Chris Capital right, and such, right? right. Um, and, and people come back to those as well. Uh, VC is where I think there's a lot more variability. It's, it's funny because VC is always hiring and never hiring. So um, I think they look for the right people at the right time and also uh, fund fit and where they are in the funding cycle matters a lot for lot more for VC um, than it does for private equity, I think, um, because still private equity is a little bit more, uh, I guess, less risky of an asset class than VC is. So um, there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, so VC funds, it purely depends on um, whether you find a fund that's the right fit for you. So which is why the numbers vary a lot. Some years you would have maybe just two or And it also depends on the interest of students to come back to India. So of all of those factors together make it very hard for me to say how many come back every year. Um, but, so but yeah, let's, you can, just, let's just say we, we uh, are talking about only late stage private equity funds, which are global private yeah. equity like Blackstone, yeah. Warburg. And you said that there are about about 10 firms which are yeah, right now functioning in ones, India. Yeah. So, so is it safe to assume if you have to quantify this around about 10 to 12 roles every year? No, because not every all of them will hire every year. Ah, maybe less than that. Yeah, so five, okay. maybe six. Wow. Yeah. How exclusive this, uh, this, this job is. Now I'm sort of realizing this. <laughs> Uh, wow. no, I think, like I said, right, they're not large funds, right? They have 30 of people. Course, course. So if they're hiring one person, that's a significant um, <laughs> proportion of the office, yeah. right? So it's just it's just how it it is structured as an industry. Understood. Understood. Uh, there's one question I, I, I always wondered why certain things happen the way they happen. I've seen a lot of Indians who say uh, go to go for their pre-MBA stints or in general, they are in basically, they're doing MBAs from the top B schools. Uh, why do they come back and do investing in India? I've not seen a Blackstone US hiring an Indian. I've seen a Blackstone uh, India going to the US B school and hiring an Indian. Why is it that, why, why is this trend so? So I think investing is in general, a very local business, and it's a very long term business. So for you to see the fruits of an investment that you make, it might take seven years. And so um, unlike tech, where you can be a product manager in Google for two years and then come back and in, to India, and then that experience will be very valuable in investing to build a track record, it takes years it doesn't take mm. months or weeks right and and multiple years sometimes it takes decades so it is uh, a little bit of a call on where you want to be long term so first i'm talking from a student's perspective why they come back um and second it is a local business so for me to add value from day one which is very much the expectation post mba i need to know something about the market to make a decision uh, about whether i want to invest in a company or not I really need to know about how the market works, what other companies are there, have some work experience to figure out what a good business looks like and what a good business looks like in India. And that is, uh, at the end of the day, investing is about taking calls. And the more information you have, the more context you have, the better calls that you can take. So uh, that's why investing tends to be a little bit of a local business. And mm -hmm. which is why I was having a conversation with somebody and 
Um, they were saying if there are such few people in the India office, why have an India office at all, right? But uh, of course, you would want to have an India office because it's almost impossible to make India investments sitting out of um, the US or UK yes. or anywhere else in the world because you need that local context, you need the local connects. And, and so from anyone who wants to do investing and be in India in the long term, I think um, it makes a lot of sense to come back. Um, and I'm speaking from personal experience as well. Um, from a funds perspective, I think I'll go back to the point that I mentioned earlier. I think a lot of it is about work experience. Mm -hmm. It isn't, um, I, I did have high six years of work experience before I came here, as opposed to one, two, three years of work experience. So I think it all comes down to that. I don't think it's about just US business schools or, uh, of course, there is some signaling value to that. Um, but I think more broadly, it's about how much work experience someone has. Awesome. This this really clarifies everything I had to understand about how uh, global private equity funds in India uh, they end up hiring folks post MBA. Uh, if say for example, uh, you have to sort of give one advice uh, to students who aspire to have to go for a global private equity role, aspire to apply for a global private equity role post MBA, what would that be? So firstly, use the time between getting in to your MBA and actually going for your MBA very wisely. Uh, try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, and I think it's not just about getting in, but also figuring out how you can do well as an investor. And if you focus on that, I think the recruiting process will also get easier. Because if you genuinely want to make a good career in investing and you kind of have that long-term goal in your mind as opposed to the short-term short -term milestones that I spoke about, um, automatically you'll start investing in yourself in a way that will make you a good, better investor and that will shine through in, in the recruiting process as well. So um, those are the few things I would say. And then, of course, speak to as many people who are doing this um, as possible, right? And really try to understand what does the day to day look like? Um, how do people make judgments or uh, judgment calls or investment decisions? Um, and figuring out that process is really the proof of the pudding, right? Um, and it takes years and which is why it's very much a watching and learning kind of a business. But yeah, Rhea, thank you so much for doing this podcast. Sure. Uh, I hope this helps a lot of people who aspire to, you know, be in the same uh, place as you at some point. And I'm sure that you're a very helpful person. People can also reach out to you via LinkedIn. Absolutely, we'll absolutely, absolutely. I mean, anyone in the audience, if anything I said resonated with you, feel free to reach out to me on anything I can help with. I'm super open, super happy to help. Um, and thanks for having me again. <laughs>